My name is Matt Walker and I'm with Simplify Power and today we're going to be talking about mobile applications with our products. So to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, I'm going to give a brief background about our company and myself. I'm going to talk about battery chemistry and form factor, you know, the internals inside of the battery, how it's actually built. We're going to talk about our products, what we specifically offer for mobile solutions, and different specifications of those products. We're going to talk then about mobile design um, considerations. So what do you need to keep in mind when you're outfitting a camper van, um, you know, renovating an RV, maybe setting up a mobile food truck, all these different mobile applications? What are the considerations that you have to make when designing and installing the system. And I know a lot of these mobile systems are DIY style. Um, so we're gonna talk about kind of reminders for newbies or DIYers that are not necessarily specific to mobile applications. We're gonna talk about product advantages that we have over other brands and mobile use case examples. We're gonna have some line diagrams and some photos of installs. We're also gonna talk about our installer qualification program and how we can send business your way. And lastly, we'll have time for question and answer at the end. So if you do have questions in the middle of the presentation, pop them into the Q&A section of the chat there. I'll probably open them right away and answer them on the spot, but if not, I'll get to them all at the end of the presentation. Cool, so without further ado, let's get started. Again, my name is Matt. Uh, I work here at Simplify Power as one of our trainers here. But before working here, I did actually work at a camper van renovation company. So we would take used work vans and renovate them, you know, strip them bare, and then put in, you know, all these different appliances, electrical systems, solar, and of course, batteries on every system. So this was a, a big time in my life, learning how to help people boondock really and, and camp without any services. So making sure they weren't reliant on solar or excuse me, on shore power making sure they were able to harvest enough solar energy and store it in their battery bank to get by through the night. And that that system survived what was literally an earthquake every day as they drove around. So this is um, a fun job for me. Now I get to kind of share, hopefully share some tips with you guys. So Simplify as a company, we were founded in 2010. We actually started under the name OES Energy. We were making mobile power packs for Hollywood filmmakers at the time. And so we really have proved our roots in the mobile application. I mean, something that a cameraman can lug around and run around with in, you know, in their occupation was where we started. So proving our roots there, I think is really a harder thing to do in, uh, in terms of design than residential storage. And then from there, we moved on to residential, military, and emergency response. So the military did not even want lithium batteries for their project, but we submitted a bid anyway and simply explained that lithium iron phosphate is not the same as other chemistries. As numerous safety advantages, there's no risk of fire or thermal runaway propagating to other batteries or you know, other cells within a battery. In 2013, we expanded our product line. We're always thinking about the installer and the customer. What do you guys need? And in 2015 was when we relaunched as Simplify Power. We're now ramping up manufacturing at our Oxnard, California facility. And we have since become a Briggs and Stratton company. So that's the background of our company. Talking about battery chemistry specifically, there are many options here. So lithium is not all the same. Lithium ion can mean a whole number of different things. 
Whereas NMC batteries contain cobalt. Cobalt is extremely energy dense and it's also a bit thermally unstable. So that makes battery a little bit unsafe. It can, you know, catch fire if it were to go into thermal runaway, actually start a fire. Whereas lithium iron phosphate, it's really not able to release heat quickly enough to start a fire because it doesn't contain that energy dense cobalt. It's, yes, it's a little less energy dense, but it's a whole lot safer. So lithium iron phosphate is able to withstand high temperature environments of up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And on the low side, you know, pretty much all lithium batteries face the same limitation of not being able to charge below freezing. So you can operate them down to freezing and they don't lose any capacity. Really, well, they don't lose a significant amount of capacity as the temperature drops, unlike lead acid, which lose up to 50% of their capacity in extremely low temperatures. Uh, you know, so that is one advantage of lithium iron phosphate already for mobile applications. Not only is it safer, but it does not lose energy significantly at cold temperatures. There's no need for venting these batteries. Um, there's no need for cooling equipment and no need for safety monitoring equipment. <clears throat> now, how we actually build our batteries is we use cylindrical cells. So when you look at the comparison of different form factors here on the right, we've got cylindrical, pouch, and prismatic cells. I would encourage you, if you're looking for a battery for mobile applications, to really, really shy away from pouch cells. There are batteries out there, you know, marketed for mobile applications specifically that are made the same way that um, we make laptops and cell phones. Pouch cells are not going to be rugged enough, in my opinion, to stand up to uh, a daily earthquake, as in driving around on a bumpy road. So pouch cells are basically, there's no steel or aluminum encasing. They're just kind of a, a very thin pouch that's easy to puncture. It's able to swell or you know change sizes slightly as temperature shrinks or rises. So this is not a super durable battery. Prismatic cells are great, nothing wrong with them. They're just uh, did not really fit the form factor that we needed. We found better performance and lifespan out of cylindrical cells, as well as optimal safety, really. So what that is what we use in all of our products across the board is lithium iron phosphate chemistry and cylindrical form factor. We also have an integrated BMS internal to the batteries and a circuit breaker on top. So the BMS, as usual, will handle overcurrent protection, short circuit protection, charge and discharge, you know, over and under voltage, essentially, and most importantly, cell balancing. Now, the breaker on top, it's going to add additional overcurrent protection, but it's also really just a handy feature for installing. You know, especially in uh, mobile systems, when you don't have a lot of space to work in, you're trying not to short those terminals with your wrench or any other metal nearby. Um, again, and you're working in a tight space, it can be really nice to just turn that battery off while you're installing it. No sparks flying and simply turn it back on once you've got everything all wired up. So we make a 3.8 kilowatt hour battery. This comes in both 24 and 48 volts. It is a parallel connection only. So do not buy a 24 volt battery thinking you're gonna series connect them into a 48 volt bank. Just buy the 48 volt battery to connect them in parallel. These are really infinitely scalable. So, I mean, in a mobile application, you're not gonna run into needing two, 20, 40, 60 batteries, but in reality, in a residential application, this battery um, has no limitation as to how many you can parallel. We have seen systems of over 100 batteries in one bank. 
We also make a very similar battery. So, you know, same lithium iron phosphate chemistry and cylindrical form factor in a 1.4 kilowatt hour battery. Now, if we go back, we see that the 3.8 has a metal case. This is a steel powder coated case. And the 1.4 actually has a plastic ABS case. The reason for this is that not only is it slightly more lightweight, it's also more suited to marine applications. So if you are worried about corrosion and you don't want to, you know, maybe scratch the battery and see that corrosion on the exterior, this plastic case is going to be more resistant to corrosion. Well, obviously plastic cannot corrode. So this is the go-to if you're in a marine application. This battery is offered in both 12 and 24 volts. And the advantage of both of these batteries is that they're compatible with a wide range of equipment. They don't require communications. So if you've got an existing older piece of equipment like a charge controller or inverter, as long as you can custom program settings into that piece of equipment, there's a very good chance that it's compatible with our battery, that it's able to reach those set points that our batteries need to see. It's also got three inch terminal posts. That's going to make it for easy wiring, um, you know, as opposed to those other type of posts sticking up on a lot of the popular mobile batteries. If you're not looking to permanently install something, we do have some other solutions for you as well. We've got these waterproof kits that we really use for emergency response ourselves. Um, and these are able to, you know, add a solar kit and simply just power items. You'll open the case and plug loads in directly to the inverter here. We've also got our express unit. So this is portable, but uh, not something you're going to be throwing in your car for a weekend trip, most likely. This is really probably portable for homes and businesses. It's a larger scale thing. It's got a 4,400 4, watt inverter, a 100 amp charge controller, and two 3.8 kilowatt hour batteries. This is already pre-built and pre-wired. Pre everything is installed for you. So you've got a PV inlet, you've got AC outlets, so you can plug loads directly in, and you've got an AC inlet as well. So you can simply just plug this in from an extension cord, charge it up, and then swap that extension cord around and use it to power your load. So if that's what you want to do with this, it is really no install needed. <clears throat> All right, so jumping into the fun stuff, let's talk about not only mobile considerations for design, but also when you're doing this yourself, what you should keep in mind if you're not a pro, or maybe you don't have the tools that a pro has and you wanna keep it simple. Maybe you just need a quick reminder as to lithium versus lead acid. All these considerations, let's, let's talk about them. So if you're doing this yourself, big reminder, do not daisy chain your batteries. So with lead acid batteries, they're gonna be wired just like this. This is not the proper way to wire your batteries. So we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but also many things that uh, people who are new to lithium batteries forget is battery monitoring. You don't necessarily need a battery monitor, but if you don't have one, you're basically gonna have no clue how much energy you have left until you're very close to emptying your bank. So this is optional, but highly recommended. It serves as a fuel gauge so you can see the percentage you have left. So let's, let's detail these two. So when we're looking at daisy chaining, with, lead, with a, either type of battery, you may have you know, a half volt drop across the wire between the inverter and the first battery in the bank. That's normal. But then as it goes along the bank, the cascading effect will cause the voltage to drop, you know, as you move further from the inverter. So you may have another one volt drop across one end of the bank to the other. Whether you have lithium or lead acid batteries, this is possibility if you've wired them this way. And these are realistic numbers. So 
this is not really an issue with lead acid batteries because when you look at lead acid, the discharge curve is, is quite straight. So a one volt difference, that may be 10, 15, at most 20% state of charge difference between one end of the bank and the other end of the bank. Not ideal, but that's not a huge problem. You know, if you've got AGM or um, just flooded lead acid, not a big deal. When you're looking at lithium, lithium batteries, a one volt difference, this is our actual discharge curve, a one volt difference across the bank. Let's look here, we've got the C over two discharge here at 10% at 52 volts, doesn't reach 51 volts until it's at 70% discharged. That's a 60% state of charge difference in one volt. That is definitely a problem because that means this battery on the right side of your screen closest to the inverter is doing all the work. And the one on the left is barely doing any work. They're gonna wear unevenly and then it's going to cause imbalances in your system over time. This can void your warranty of your batteries and it's not good practice. Additionally, so as you see, they'll also share current unevenly because of these voltage differences. It just adds to the problem. So understanding not to daisy chain wire is important. And then for the same you know, reason, understanding this flat discharge and charge curve of lithium batteries, that is the same reason you need battery monitoring. So with a lead acid battery, you can just measure the voltage and you get a very close idea of state of charge. I mean, not perfect, but within, within range. Measuring the voltage of a lithium ion battery does not tell you very much at all about its state of charge. You're pretty much in the dark until you have a battery monitor. That monitor is gonna measure the amount of current that's gone into the battery and the amount that's come out. So again, it's important to not only wire properly, but have a battery monitor if you're doing a DIY system. Now this is a correct example of wiring here. All of the cables for each battery should be the same length and same size, so same gauge wire, going to a common connection point. That connection point, um, what I would recommend is a Lynx distribution system. So we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. But for mobile scenarios, Victron provides a really great combiner here. This is going to still probably have, you know, if you've got 56 volts here, it may drop a half a volt or so. Um, and you may have 55 and a half to each battery when you're charging, but that's normal and that's acceptable. That is to be expected. Having each battery at the same voltage is, is going to be ideal perform, performance for your battery. And after setting up the system in this exact manner, I actually took an amp clamp to each positive wire on each battery and measured the current going to each battery. And they were within a quarter of an amp of each other. And then their voltage was within a tenth of a volt of each other. So this is pretty much ideal and just shows you that it does work when you make a system symmetrical. So these are the combiners that I would recommend using is the Victron Lynx system. They have a distributor, which is a positive, a negative bus bar and fuses. So this is perfect for your loads. So you can fuse each load wire, it takes mega fuses. They've got a power in module. So this is just a positive and negative bus bar, no fuses, which you really don't need for the batteries as they have breakers on them. Um, but you know you can always add extra overcurrent protection if you'd like. And they even offer a shunt. So this is a battery monitor. There's a shunt inside of this uh, bus bar system here. The reason I don't see this used quite as often is because it does not work with Bluetooth alone. You're really gonna need um, the multiple extra components. You're gonna need the Victron uh, G2 
GX system to really make good use of this component. So I don't see this used as often. We'll talk about other battery monitors as we go on. But these, these distributors, the distributor and power in and shunt, they all stack together so you can take as many power ins as you need. So, so these have four connections each. And let's say you end up needing six batteries. Well, you just parallel two of these power in connectors. They stack right on top of each other with no additional parts needed. So that's why I like this so much. It's fully encased and fully insulated. So you don't have you know, exposed connections as your vehicle's bouncing around the road. But you could just use a standard bus bar, uh, one for positive and one for negative. And you could even use a, a multi-tap splice. This is way more commonly found in your local hardware store. Um, these are, you know, maybe 50 bucks. They're super easy to find. So this is one option. If you need to throw something together in a hurry, you can use one of these. So in terms of battery monitoring, where is this gonna get wired in and what should I use? First off, you should definitely check out the BMB712 Smart Monitor by Victron. This is made for lithium batteries. So I see tons of companies offer a battery monitor but many, many times they're not programmable or they're made for lead acid batteries in general. Just isn't as accurate when monitoring, you know, current in and current out of a lithium battery. So I really do recommend the BMB 712. It's kind of going to create this whole architecture of your system where your, your battery monitor can communicate to your Victron charge controller and your Victron battery protect and your inverter and tell it these, this information it's gathering from the batteries. Maybe they're too hot, too cold, they're getting full, they're empty and need a charge. It's gonna help your other devices understand what's going on with your battery. So we'll talk more about you know, what you're able to do with the battery monitor, but here's how it's wired in. This is going to intercept all the current going to and from your battery bank. So, you know, prior to the batteries reaching the DC or AC loads or the inverter charger for shore power, prior to any of that, the battery monitor shunt is gonna be wired in on the main battery negative wire. All right, so even if you're not doing this DIY style, if you're using Phi for mobile storage, some things you should keep in mind are, number one, alternator charging. Number two, cold weather. And number three, DC loads. These are not things that you would find in a residential system. Alternator charging is difficult with lithium batteries because they have a lower internal resistance than lead acid batteries do. Alternators are made to work with lead acid batteries. So when you hook a lithium battery up to them, they basically see a black hole and they try to pump as much current as they can out. They actually will pump more current than they're able to. And ultimately that will cause them to overheat and get destroyed. I've actually tried this on my own alternator. So I just had to try it out. I was too curious. So I hooked up a lithium iron phosphate battery. That was not a Simplify battery, luckily, to my alternator, just to see how much current it would pump out if connected directly to the alternator when it was basically empty. And my 90 amp alternator pumped out 115 amps for just a couple minutes before I turned it off to avoid damaging it. So another thing to consider is that if you're charging your batteries quickly with your alternator, uh, cooling of that alternator is linked to the RPMs your vehicle is running at. So if you're idling and charging quickly, your alternator might overheat. It shouldn't de deliver its full rated current at idle. It should really only be sized to deliver maybe 20 to at most 50% 
of what that alternator can handle. Um, 20 is a 20% is a very safe number. So for example, my 90 amp alternator, it would be very safe for me to install an 18 amp DC to DC charger to take 18 amps from that alternator to my battery. If I had a very large alternator and I knew I was not going to use all that energy that I could, uh, it would be maybe acceptable for me to go up to 30, 40, even 50% of that alternator's capacity to charge my battery bank. Beyond just protecting your alternator, you also want to be sure your alternator doesn't damage your lithium batteries. I mean, those are an investment in themselves. So the alternator is not going to know what type of battery it's looking at. It's just going to charge at the same voltage it can. So it may overcharge your lithium batteries. And that is another thing to avoid. So in general, do not hook up your alternator or your starter engine battery directly in parallel with your house battery bank, especially if it's a lithium battery. You're going to need some sort of device in between those two regulating that charge. We'll talk more about that. Um, cold weather, so you really need to prevent charging below freezing. Otherwise, your battery is going to degrade and degrade fast. So the best strategy here is to keep your batteries warm. They like being at room temperature, but that's not always possible. So sometimes we need to make sure that devices are programmed to not charge the batteries when they sense that they're freezing. We'll talk about that. And DC loads. So what happens when you leave your car light on overnight? It just draws your battery right down to zero volts, maybe two, three volts and you can't start your car, right? So that same thing is possible with a lithium battery. Lithium batteries do have a BMS that cuts off that power when they reach a certain low voltage, but your battery will still be dead and it could still take damage if this happens multiple times. So you shouldn't just draw loads direct from the battery. You should have some sort of low voltage cutoff protection in line there. Now your inverter is already gonna have this built in. So your AC loads, you, know, you don't have to worry about that, um, but your DC loads will need some sort of device, uh, you know, opening that circuit, cutting off power to them if the battery drops to a certain low voltage. So let's talk more in detail about these. When you are alternator charging, the best products I like to use is an Orion Smart Charger. I installed one of these recently, and there's two options for these. You can do isolated or non-isolated. So isolated means they have separate grounds, and non-isolated means they have common grounds. Basically a common ground, maybe you're using the vehicle chassis as a ground for both batteries. I'll let you figure that one out on your own. It's not going to make a huge difference. Our battery does not mind being grounded or, un or isolated. Either way, it's totally fine. You can parallel multiple of these Orion smart chargers to increase your charging capacity. And you can place a remote on and off switch somewhere convenient, like I would recommend placing it on your dash. Then you can simply use this charger only when you need it and only when you're at high RPMs. I don't know if you're like me, but I definitely wanted to use more than 20% of my alternator's 90 amp capacity. So I really only use it at high RPMs when I'm not using other power elsewhere in my vehicle. And I certainly you know, don't turn it on before I leave. I turn it on once I'm on the highway. So I do have a switch on my dashboard that turns that charger on and off. And I also don't like to use more, um, you know, fossil fueled power electricity than I have to. I wanna to rely on solar as much as possible. As far as charging below freezing pre prevention, the best thing to use is really just a whole Victron system. This all starts with the Victron battery monitor. The 712 is going to basically communicate with all the other devices 
the, the BMV712 is going to measure the battery temperature through this temperature sensor you see here on the right. And it's going to, via Bluetooth, communicate that with any other chargers or devices in the system that are Bluetooth enabled. You can also use a smart battery sense, and this can also communicate via Bluetooth. Um, one advantage here is if you're using a off-brand charge controller, so non-Victron charge controller, you can actually use a battery protect to turn off that charge controller's output when the temperature drops below freezing. You would need a BMB to accomplish this, however. Lastly, you can use a Victron Lynx shunt to accomplish this, but I'm not going to discuss how to do it because it is quite complicated. It's going to need several additional parts, and I think that really the better way to do it is using the BMB. So let's talk a little bit more about how to set up these different charging below freezing uh, preventions. So this is one way. Let's say you've got your off-brand charge controller. You're going to take the positive of that charge controller and run it through a Victron battery protect. And note that this battery protect is directional. So you want the current to go in where it says in and out where it says out. You don't want the this reversed or you will damage the battery protect. So this is the back side of the BMV's actual LCD screen. What you'll do is you'll program it uh, on your phone using Bluetooth, and then you'll use the two small included wires to run between NC and COM, and then these two connections on the remote port of the BMV, or excuse me, the battery protect. When the battery protect sees that signal that, oh, the batteries have dropped to below freezing, it's just going to open that circuit stopping the charge controller from sending any current to the battery in those cold temperatures. So again, this is the best workaround if you have non-Victron components that you're not able to program to stop charging below freezing. And you can use this same product, a Victron battery protect for your DC loads. Um, in the case of DC loads, you do not need a battery protect, or excuse me, a battery monitor to check on the temperature of the batteries. This battery protect that you see on the screen is all you need. It's able to monitor the voltage of the battery itself and then open the circuit when the voltage of the battery gets too low. So make sure whenever you're ordering Victron components, just get the smart version. That is the one that comes with Bluetooth compatibility so that you can program it and then it can talk to other Victron devices in the network. So it does seem like I've talked a lot about Victron today. I would like to also talk about the advantages of using Simplify. When you're in a mobile application, what is important? You know, if you're choosing between different brands of lithium batteries, one thing that's extremely important is energy density. So how much energy can you pack into a small space and a small weight? We are actually 7% more energy dense. And I mean that in terms of specific energy, so you know, energy per pound, than our number one lithium iron phosphate competitor in terms of the mobile market. So we are the most energy dense mobile style battery that I have found in terms of our 1.4 kilowatt hour battery. In addition, this battery comes with a very high power availability. So this is going to cover a big demand in a small package. So let's say you want to turn on a microwave. You maybe don't need um, to power that microwave for three hours. You just need it for a couple of minutes. So having to size a lead acid bank to power that battery for just a few minutes, power that microwave for just a few minutes, you'd end up having all this excess battery that you don't need just because the discharge rate of a lead acid battery is so slow that you have to make a huge bank to handle a temporary load 
Whereas with lithium iron phosphate, with five batteries in specific, you can discharge at half of their rated capacity. So if you've got, if you've got 10 kilowatt hours of batteries, you can discharge them at five kilowatts. The same rate applies for charging. So you can charge them very quickly as well. This helps you maximize PV production. Maybe you're only parked in the sun for a couple of hours each day. Maybe you've got to turn on a generator to power your food truck because it's not in the sun. Um, this is going to help you do that quickly. Maybe you even need to pull over at a gas station and plug into shore power. Again, this is going to help you cut down on that time you have to spend stopped. Lastly, one of the biggest advantages for me is the built-in breaker and terminal posts. This makes installation and wiring way easier having to be able to kill the output. So this is common on residential style solar batteries, having a breaker. But to be honest, this is not something that I find on a lot of mobile style lithium batteries is having a breaker or kill switch. Terminal posts are also not common. This is not something you see on a lot of mobile batteries. If you're comparing Simplify to lead acid batteries, I mean, first, just look at the photo and how the space has just opened up. We've increased the storage capacity and power availability and decreased the size of the bank. Additionally, there's no maintenance, no toxic components, no ventilation requirements, you know, no risk of explosion with lithium versus lead acid and a much longer lifespan. So I actually purchased a... AGM battery when I was first starting out uh, building vans and it only lasted one year of intense use. So a lithium battery is going to last you 10 years. You're going to end up spending less time maintaining that and swapping it out. And it's ultimately going to give you a better value per kilowatt hour when we talk about the cost of energy Often people are a little wrapped up in this upfront cost. Oh, this battery's a thousand and this one's only 300. I'm going to get the $300 one. Well, how long does it last? How much are you paying per cycle, you know, per kilowatt hour that you get out of it? That's the more important factor to look at. Let's look at some cool use case examples. I mean, we see people using our batteries in tiny homes. Um, we see them used in RVs. This is a really good one by Northern Arizona Wind and Sun's kind of sister company, Mobile Solar Electric. They will do installations and they are great. We've got our batteries in camper vans. This is not the same van as the equipment you see, but you understand the point. And even in mobile businesses, we get a ton of inquiries for food trucks every day, it seems. So we get more and more. So lastly, before I jump into the question and answer part of the presentation, I want to talk about our IQ program. So why would you join our IQ program? So if you're already installing our products, it takes about five minutes to join we can put you on our map. This gives customers a place to find you if they need an install done. We end up, our sales team uses this page to find installers for customers who need one. So we end up sending you direct leads um, for new business from our team directly to you. And above all, we can give you 25 bucks cash back in your pocket per battery installed. You're only eligible for this if you are a member of the IQ program. It's simple to claim. You simply just have to submit a warranty registration form with your batteries. So that's, it's, it's a simple process that most of you are already doing. We also have a photo contest for IQ installers. So you can win up to 250 bucks for your next purchase. This is you know, something where we'd love to see your face if possible. But if equipment is all you got, we'll, we'll make the best of it.
If you have not applied yet and you're already installing our products, you can apply here in about five minutes, or you can simply email me at training at simplifypower.com. My email will be at the end of this presentation. Perfect, there we go. So plenty of time for question and answer. Um, please put your questions in the chat in the Q&A section so I can answer them. What can I expand on? Gary wants to know where he can purchase a Victron BMB and a Simplify battery. You can purchase those from whatever distributor you're working with. Um, you know, for example, I showed this installation of Northern Arizona Wind and Sun right here. So you can purchase from Northern Arizona Wind and Sun. Um, and you can also get it installed by them if you need. Yes, our batteries are made in the US. We are doing our manufacturing in Oxnard, California. They are eligible for S-chip, but that is more of a red residential um, rebate program. All right, quiet group today. Thanks everybody for jumping on today and have a wonderful day. Oh, good question. All right, range of temperatures lithium iron batteries can withstand inside a cabinet. So lithium batteries cannot charge below freezing, but they can operate all the way from negative four Fahrenheit all the way to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how you can store or discharge them at those temperatures. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.